Okay, now we're going to kind of move into a little bit different category. These are going to, we're going to talk about the more tropical and subtropical types of milkweeds. Several of these varieties you see very readily along the Gulf, um, along the Florida, uh, southern areas especially. Uh, so uh, we definitely have them in the United States. Um, but usually kind of in the, you know, zone 10s and zone 11s. Um, they're going to be borderline here in our zone 9s and, and 8B. Um, and in the colder zones, they're going to be treated like you would a hibiscus or something like that, a, a more tropical type of plant. So uh, balloon plant, this is a really interesting plant. We've got a little uh, uh, somebody on here wanting some nectar, a little native uh, wasp, a smaller version. I don't know exactly which type this is, but um, a lot of our pollinators really enjoy the flowers on the balloon plant. It's kind of interesting because it hangs upside down, whereas a lot of our other milkweeds are more of an upright or sideways type of flower. So when our pollinators are on this, they're hanging upside down as well. So that gives you some interesting pictures with some of the, um, the butterflies. He, he was going for, well, well, let's take advantage of this little situation here. So we've got this wasp on here. And the reason I moved the plant is because he was going back to the leaves to start searching for caterpillars and eggs. So a wasp is one of the uh, dreaded predators to our uh, caterpillars and our eggs of the monarch and um, the queen butterflies. So here he goes again looking at the, at the different leaves. Okay, so let's go on because he's gonna be here for a while obviously and I uh, am gonna make sure I don't really swat at him. That's probably not a good idea. <laughs> so the balloon plant, um, like some of these other uh, tropicals and subtropicals, subtrop like a lot of moisture. So it can get quite large. Um, I've had them get up maybe seven feet tall or so. Uh, Multi-flowered, once they start flowering, a uh, lot of pollinators like the flowers. Um, one reason I find this a good plant to grow is because I have a lot of caterpillars and sometimes we need help getting enough caterpillar food for them and you know some of our other varieties may not be quite as leafy so in that regard I will usually grow it and um, all of the caterpillars that I've grown on this have become quite fat and quite large so it seems to be uh, a good healthy food source for the caterpillars and um, if you all tend to run out of milkweed and are, are always needing more this might be a good plant for you to try. You can put it in the ground, you can put it in pots, it does like a lot of fertilizer and I would suggest using Dr. Iron on it. It likes a soil that's a little more um, acid than our, our high alkaline soil and water so sometimes it'll get a little yellow and have a, a few issues. Um, I've noticed the more fertilizer and uh, soil sulfur, iron, those types of things that I add to the soil, they seem to do much better. So a good one to try. Can't really take anything but light freezes. It'll come back with a light freeze. But other than that, um, you might want to treat it like a tropical plant. Alrighty, let's talk about the blue milkweed vine. This is a very interesting um, tropical type of plant. It cannot really take much freeze at all. Um, they call it Tweedia. Um, a, a lot of the growers grow it specifically for the blue flowers because it's such a unique color of blue. Um, as far as a host plant goes, um, I'm not really thinking a whole lot uh, of it. I would rather see all of these other varieties uh, as far as a host plant. 
but because it has such a unique flower and really kind of an interesting type of plant, I thought we would go ahead and talk about it. And it is a milkweed. Um, if you get online and look, a lot of people will talk about the caterpillars on it. But uh, at the butterfly landing, we really don't get any attention on it. They, they want to go towards the natives and, and uh, the milkweed tree and balloon and some of those types uh, uh, much, mu are much, much preferred over this particular one. Uh, it's not real picky with its care. Um, like all of the milkweeds, it's going to like a, a very good amount of sun uh, and a regular amount of water. Um, true to kind of more tropical plant style, it's, uh, it doesn't really like it when it gets real dry. I do cut off the, the seed pods to get more blooming because the main reason I'm growing it is for the blooms itself. So it'll bloom all summer long if you keep it cut off and um, uh, go ahead and fertilize on a regular basis. So just for that plant uh, bloom color, you might want to grow this one. All righty, we kind of uh, overlooked one that is actually a wonderful milkweed. It is the swamp milkweed. It, we do have lots of them that are native to us all the way down into to zone 10 and possibly even zone 11. Um, and then all the way uh, up north, uh, probably to about zone 7-ish. Um, but uh, the the reason I didn't categorize it with some of our other milkweed, native milkweeds, is because it needs a little bit more water. I do water this on a regular basis. I really don't let it get super dry, uh, although it probably wouldn't kill it because it does have a, a very strong root system. Uh, it does not have rhizomes like some of these others. Uh, so it is not able to sustain longer periods of drought like uh, many of our natives do. This has more of a, a, a thick root system that taps right into moisture levels in uh, ponds and, and river bottoms and low-lying areas where water seems to drain into. Uh, thus its name, uh, swamp milkweed. Some of the swamp milkweeds can have pretty blooms. Uh, some are whitish colored and some are a little bit more pink and there's even one that's even more, you know, kind of purplish or more lavender uh, color bloom to it. So they're quite attractive. Normally these are going to get really, really tall and very wispy looking. But with that being said, then you've got a lot of leaves and uh, the monarchs and the queens really enjoy this plant a lot, especially when it has newer growth. Um, they'll tend to lay right on that younger foliage that's real tender, and uh, they, they will eat this stuff up. So <laughs> it really is uh, maybe a little easier for some people to grow in a garden area. Um, and if you put it in pots, regular watering, you should be good to go. Alrighty, let's talk about uh, one that has received a whole lot of, of talk. Uh, some, sometimes you'll see this uh, down at the Riverwalk area now. Um, this is the giant milkweed tree and it truly can be a giant. Um, I have one, mm, my goodness, I want to say it's like eight feet tall right now. It is one that is in the ground. And um, Joelle, how large is the one over at Ronnie's at Thousand Oaks area? Six, over six feet and probably what, about four feet wide? Yeah, so they get very, very large. Um, the one at our Thousand Oaks location is Gigantia prosea, which is just a little different variety. Um, this is uh, often called the crown flower. And that one is not because the flower resembles a little crown right in the center there. It's kind of neat looking. Looks like a little cardinal hat or something like that. But yeah, very, very interesting flower. I love the scent of this one. To me, it's kind of fruity. Some people may not like it. I tend to really enjoy the scent of this. Um, 
the thing I like the best about this plant, other than how absolutely gorgeous it is as a plant, um, it provides a lot of caterpillar food. So those of us, again, who have a lot of caterpillars, we're always struggling to, to have plenty of food for them. This is the plant for you. So you're gonna wanna cut it down. And I sterilize mine with either uh, hydrogen peroxide or alcohol after they've been eaten down by a bunch of caterpillars. That way I can kind of keep it clean for the next batch I use. Um, so I really squirt it down very, very good, make sure my pot and everything is really clean. If I feed uh, milkweed to somebody, they've eaten it down, I don't want to just feed the next batch. Uh, I want to clean it, make sure it's, it's all good and healthy. Then you're going to get new growth on it. If it gets too tall and eaten up by one batch of caterpillars, I suggest just chopping it off sterilizing it and then the next batch will have all fresh younger healthy leaves um, when uh, we have a, a big group of caterpillars that have eaten everything in our garden this is the perfect plant another thing this might be good for is if we have classrooms teachers uh, Girl Scouts, different people that want to uh, have a lot of caterpillars and watch the life cycle. This will give them a lot of good healthy food and they get nice and fat on this. They, they get large and um, so for that reason alone I have to recommend this plant. It is a little on the needy side. It likes uh, a lot of water and it likes a lot of fertilizer but um, that is explained by its huge fast growth. It grows very, very, very fast. So uh, definitely one you wanna try if you've got lots of caterpillars to feed. Okay, the last one we're gonna talk about today is tropical milkweed. And there is so much controversy about this plant. But there is a major thing that I want to remind everyone about this plant. I would recommend it. I would use it when you're just starting out uh, because it's going to be easier to grow than many of these others. The main thing I want you to remember with this plant is cut it down three times a year. The foliage itself, if it's nice and clean, is a good healthy source for your caterpillars. If it's been uh, 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 visited by many butterflies that have diseases and parasites and different things on them, then it can be transmitted to other varieties or other, or other, other butterflies and caterpillars. So if we're diligent in cutting this plant back, I cut it back the first time right after our monarch migration has gone through and the caterpillars have eaten. I cut it way down and if you want to you can also sterilize that with hydrogen peroxide or alcohol and I'm going to fertilize it and keep the moisture up on it and it's going to come back with all fresh new growth for our queens during the summer months. Our queens do love this plant and they will lay a lot of eggs on this through the summer months and that's a good thing. So by the end of summer this plant usually it's going to be real tall. So I always cut down a lot of my perennials. I start my fall seeds at the end of July in the first week of August. I'm going to include this plant in my must trim for that time of year. I'm going to trim it all the way back, uh, probably to about 8, 10 inches or so. And then again, if you have had a lot of visitors, you might even want to give it a little bit of uh, peroxide spray down or alcohol spray down and keep the fertilizer and the water moisture up on it so that you'll have plenty of fresh foliage for the monarchs when they come through in the fall. 
So we're going to probably see them maybe September, October, and, and hopefully by early November they're already bugged out of here. After the caterpillars have, have eaten, then this is the third must. You have to trim that back down. I trim these down very, very short. Very short. I'm going to probably only leave three to four inches or less on these plants. And you're going to say, well, well that, then all of the leaves and stuff are gone. But that's okay. The, the reason we're going to do that is for the health of the butterflies. But there's another thing that's going to help you guys out. You can mulch this up with a pine bark mulch or whatever mulch you, you like. I use pine bark mulch usually. Uh, it adds a little bit of acidity to the soil. And because I've covered this up, it's going to go through the winter so much better than if you just left them. They freeze and sometimes they come back and sometimes they don't. But if you cut this down and mulch it up and let it go to sleep for the winter, you're almost always going to get it to come back and it's going to be nice and healthy in the spring. When things start growing in the springtime, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go out there and I'm going to just remove that mulch from the base of this plant, expose that, and it's going to come up very quickly when the warm weather hits and then it's going to grow some fresh food to start that cycle again for our spring monarchs. So that's my recommendation with this plant. Um, don't discard it. Don't throw it away. Just be sure you cut it back three times a season. Go ahead. <laughs> Thank you for catching that. Okay, rewind. <laughs> you start wherever. So a great plant. Just remember, you've got to cut it down three times in a whole growing season or per year. Well, I want to thank Miss Robin for inviting me thank to Thank you so speak. much for coming. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> it's been exciting, and, and I really hope this has helped everybody out, uh, talking about some of the different milkweeds a little bit more in depth. And I definitely want to thank Rainbow Gardens for allowing the, the Butterfly Landing to, to provide all of these wonderful plants to you all. We hope we see you in the Butterfly area soon.